Okay, so it's an absolute delight to be here this evening with you all to um, our inaugural lecture series. And we've got two professors presenting to us uh, this evening. And actually, I think it will demonstrate a really interesting, diverse approach to careers as, as nurses. Both professors tonight um, uh, have a nursing background. Um, and what's really important is that we have the opportunity to hear about the work that they do, to um, celebrate their road to becoming a professor, because you know, those of us that have done that journey know how hard it is and um, how special this event really is. We also recognise that it's a really lovely opportunity to invite friends, family, colleagues along to, to that event. So we will take them as two separate um, uh, lectures. Um, so uh, we move now on to our second uh, speaker of the evening. And I'm really pleased and delighted to welcome Professor Sarah Ryan. And um, this will be, uh, again, a, a different perspective. So I think they're going to really complement each other wonderfully. So a little bit about Sarah. Um, she qualified as a nurse in 1987. Her journey in rheumatology nursing began when she was appointed as a ward sister at the Royal Bath Hospital in Harrogate. In 1992, Sarah moved to the Haywood Hospital as the first clinical nurse specialist in rheumatology in Stoke-on-Trent. She has remained in clinical practice all her career, supporting patients with rheumatological disorders with an emphasis on patient education and self-management skills. In 2000, Sarah was appointed the first rheumatology consultant nurse in the UK. Whilst continuing clinical practice throughout her career, Sarah has also developed an academic career in both education and research. She completed a PhD in 2000 in nursing studies. She co-led the establishment of the first MSc in rheumatology nursing, Keele's first nursing master's programme which started in 1999 and which she continues to lead. Sarah has also been active in research with particular focus on nurse specialist role development and patient well-being. She has published 89 peer-reviewed papers, written five books on rheumatology nursing and been awarded 18 research grants. In 2003, I can never get this right, whether it's 2000, 20,000, Sarah established Musculoskeletal Care, a new journal specifically for rheumatological nurses and allied health professionals. She continues as the editor. She's been the chair of the Royal College of Nursing Rheumatology Forum and secretary of the British Heart Health Professionals in Rheumatology. And in 2003, Sarah was made a Fellow of the Royal College of Nursing and in 2019 received the Droit Witch Award from the British Society of Rheumatology in recognition of her contribution as a health professional in the field of rheumatology. So without further ado, I'm delighted to invite Professor Sarah Ryan um, to come and give her talk, Rheumatology Nursing Care Education and Research. I think I'll go now. Pauline's kindly said it all, really. If we just move straight on to any questions, that would be lovely. It'd be lovely for me to do. So uh, thanks to Gwen for doing such a lovely talk. And just to reiterate what Gwen said, to thank everybody that's come tonight and uh, has supported us. It's been wonderful to see so many, and many people here. And hopefully I'll have some slides. Oh, here we go. Yes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey, which is completely different to Gwen's, because I've kept in clinical practice. I currently two, do two days in clinical practice and two days in academia. So I'm going to confess straight away, I'm a lot older than Gwen, <laughs> with it, as you can probably see under this slide here. So I did my training back in the 80s when you came out with an occupational qualification. It didn't have any academic qualification to it, but it was a wonderful training. You did six 
weeks on the wards, got to know patients. You only did two weeks in the classroom. That was enough for me. Nursing was about being with people, looking after people. So that was wonderful. And it was very traditional. You got a job in your local hospital. You did a year on a medical ward and a year on a surgical ward. And then in 1989, I was undertaking a BSc. It was, it was a bit of a battle, that, because they'd never, Harrogate Hospital had never supported a staff nurse to do a BSc. And I had to tell a white lie at that time, because they asked me what I was reading. And I didn't want to say something like Daniela Steele's romantic <laughs> or something. And I could just remember we did Mussolini by Max Hastings for A-level history. So I did let it slip that I had read that. Not too much of a lie, because I didn't say why. And I think that's why they took a punt on me. But, but because they'd never had a staff nurse doing a, 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 doing a degree before, I had to go and see the chief nurse every month and prepare a report, just so that she knew I was attending and was, you know, money was, was well uh, invested at that time. So when I was undertaking this, the nursing officers, as we called them at that time, came to see me and she said, you don't want to be doing acute stuff, it's too busy. You're going to be doing a degree, staff nurses don't normally do this. You need a lot of time. So I think you ought to go to rheumatology. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a bit boring for you, but you've got your studies. You know, once you've got them into bed, they won't be doing much. You know, you can concentrate on, on what you're doing and everything. I thought, oh, this sounds quite interesting, you know, with, with rheumatology. I had actually worked in rheumatology as an auxiliary nurse, so I did actually know there was a bit more to it than, uh, than that. But there I was thinking, I'm going to arrive at this land of <laughs> tranquility, of rheumatology. This is just going to be absolutely lovely. But for those of you in the audience that, that know about rheumatology, it's, it was a different pace of nursing. There was a lot you could do to use your nursing skills. And I soon discovered that it was the poem for me because you could use your, your, your skills to help people cope with the physical impact of the condition, the psychological, any of the depression or anxiety, and the effect it has on role as well. So although I sort of got there by a bit of a fortuitous route, it was a great place to actually work. And the hospital was situated next to the Valley Gardens, this beautiful park in Harrogate, and you could take patients out. Although I did get told off as the ward sister for taking a patient out and leaving somebody of a, a, a lesser grade to sort of look after the patient. But it was very therapeutic, taking people to the outside and, and the fresh air and, and everything as well. But arthritis, living with arthritis, it's, it's a challenging condition. Um, it's a chronic condition. It can impact on many aspects of your life. And this is um, an autobiography by Alice Peterson, A Will to Win. So Alice was an inspiring tennis player, um, thought that she'd probably end up in Wimbledon one day. She had arthritis and it affected her whole quality of life. Her mum had to do everything for her, as it says on that quote there, helping with all her activities. And she'd forgotten the meaning of independence. So, you know, living with a long-term condition um, takes a lot of getting used to. And I think nurses have got the, the skill set to help people adapt and to try and self-manage their symptoms as, as well. So my first experience, this BSc that I was doing as a staff nurse, was something that colleagues had talked about when we were all training. We, pal palliative care was very much in its infancy, and often people who were dying were nursed on busy, acute medical and surgical wards, and we all felt we hadn't really been given enough preparation. I can remember a ward sister saying to me, don't tell that patient he's dying if he asks. And I said, but he is dying. No, no, don't tell him that. Don't tell him that at all. We'll lose all hope. And the student nurses, it was very uncomfortable being in that kind of ethical situation, not really know, uh, you know how to sort of deal with this. And so I did an interview study, and student nurses' experience, my colleagues' experiences were very similar to the ones I was going through. And actually, the, the hospital went to present it to, to the hospital board, and it led to the development of an in-house training programme to equip nurses with some of the skills they needed. And that made me realise that research could lead to change. You know, it was a small-scale project of, of interviewing maybe 10 nurses, but it actually led to a change in the culture and a recognition that we needed to give more support to, 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 to student nurses at that time. So an important message for me. Then, one day, I saw an advert for Stoke-on-Trent. <laughs> Why Stoke-on-Trent? I'm not quite sure, but that was the advert, and it said clinical nurse specialist. I've been a ward sister for a couple of years. 
And I thought, well, I might go down to Stoke-on-Trent, see what it's about. Obviously, Harrogate looks like it's got a whole riding to itself up on that, <laughs> <laughs> up on that map, doesn't it? And Stoke-on-Trent looks all sort of, sort of crammed in. But I was very lucky to meet Sandra Buckley, and it's great that Sandra's come tonight, because Sandra was an inspirational manager. And the moment I met Sandra, I just knew she was somebody that would support and would help development of, of practice. I mean, she even shared her office with me. I mean, crikey, how, how good is that for somebody that you've, uh, that you've just met? And I also met three wise men. <laughs> Although it wasn't the nativity season when I came down, but there was the three wise men. And it's lovely, actually, to see Ted, Mike and, and Pete here. I remember Pete interviewing me, you know, and you've sort of like, rheumatology sister, you're looking at all those papers on new drugs, what he's going to ask. And he says, I like to go fishing. I said, oh, lovely. You know, <laughs> middle of the interview, you know, let's get to know you. He says, I have a sign on my door saying, I've gone fishing. What would the sign on your door say? <laughs> But lovely, lovely kind, lovely kind of interview. Um, and Pete particularly really liked to give objectives. It was, it was his main thing, I think, at that time. You know, let's, let's, have, let's have meaningful objectives to actually do. So I was giving these three objectives. So I'm, I'm you know, full-time in clinical practice, you know, purely, purely doing clinical work. And he asked if I'd look at developing a nurse-led drug monitor service that had been set up by, by Mike Shadforth and look at how we could get nurses involved. Mike had developed a wonderful computer program uh, that we were all keen to get established into practice. Also to look about a patient education program and to introduce self-medication onto the ward. Which do you think though, of those might have been the biggest challenge for me? One, two or three? Number three, yes, Tony, you're exactly right. Yes, number three. So introducing self-medication, the concept of people having their own medications on a ward. You know, it was seen like being sort of rocket science at that time. Well, what about the safety? What about the legislation? We had numerous discussions with the solicitors of the trust, with pharmacy. I had to find some container. I visited every shop in Stoke. It's a great way of getting to know the, you know, the area. And what we found in the end was boxes where you'd put floppy disks. Those of you who are young won't know what a floppy disk is. <laughs> and I haven't brought a picture, but there's boxes where you put these disks in. Because patients with arthritis sometimes have hand function problems, so it needed to be easy to access. And do you know, it's the one thing we, I never published on. I don't think I had it in my head at that time to think share your practice or publish, because I was busy being a clinical nurse. And yet that would have been lovely because the difference it made to people, you can take a painkiller when you need it. You haven't got to ring a bell and hope that somebody would come. You haven't got to wait for the trolley to come round and be asked at that time, do you want a painkiller or not? You know, to have that kind of, kind of independence. It was great. So starting as a, as a clinical nurse specialist, I never had one in Stoke, so great, nobody's footsteps to go into. You know, you can make the role what you, what it, what you think it would want it to be. And it led, led me to think what aspects of care were important to people with rheumatoid arthritis. And I was lucky enough to get some funding um, to actually do a PhD. And Pete was my supervisor. Now, I should have realised at that time, sorry, Pete, it isn't meant to be all about Pete Doors tonight, but, you know, it's turning into the Pete, Pete Doors memory lane going on here at the moment. But Pete said, why don't you do 40 interviews? I said, it's qualitative research, Pete. It's usually in depth. You know, we usually go between, like, 10 or 15. Oh, 10 or 15, that won't tell us anything. Gosh, you need numbers, girl, you need numbers. So... I interviewed 40 people myself. I transcribed, we didn't have transcribing companies, I'm that old, we didn't have transcribing companies in those days. Transcribed all those transcripts. So I got really immersed into rheumatology. It was great, really. Um, and what we found, that these were the important factors for people with, with rheumatoid arthritis, that what they would like us to do to help them cope with their condition was reduction of the physical symptoms. If we could do some of that, that was really recommended. Involving the family in the care. Having information, because at those times there wasn't a lot of shared information, with, you know, or shared decision making. And what was really interesting and what we published on was the impact of the clinical consultation, which can be easy to underestimate how powerful a consultation is. And you might see somebody maybe only every six months, you might just have two consultations in a year. But they were very powerful, as these two quotes <coughs> illustrate here. She listened to me and helped me to see that I could do something and I wasn't as helpless as I thought. I could not have coped without their support. They get to know you so well. 
and you do with people with long-term conditions because you are seeing them on a regular basis. So it does help to build up a really nice therapeutic relationship. And also, because we'd interviewed 40 patients, I thought some of these findings can help inform the service development. So we started to do education programmes in the evening for family members. We started to think about how could we utilise other members of the team to develop the multidisciplinary nature of care that benefits patients. So we had a nurse and occupational therapist clinic, nurse and physio, and we developed the telephone advice line which currently now receives a thousand calls a month. And our biggest challenge in current practice is how we actually deal and answer with all these calls at the moment. It's, uh, it's hugely popular with patients because it's a way of getting the chance to have a chat with uh, a member of the rheumatology team that's involved in their care. And it, it's great that Medimi's in the audience tonight. Very grateful for Medimi for travelling up from Bristol. Thank you for coming, Medimi. Because this is Medimi's work when he was doing his PhD. And it was looking at the impact of specialist nurses in clinic. And so in Medimi's work, he had patients that were going to nurse-led care and patients going to consultant-led care. And what Medimi found was that nurse-led care was not inferior, that nurses could assess disease activity and treat accordingly, but also provided education and psychological support as well. So we had some evidence to actually then go to trusts and to say, you know, if you employ people like this, they can do the job as well and, and offer something. We had to wait a while for the fourth wise man to, you know, to come along. But luckily, luckily he did. And it, it, it was such an advantage for my, for my own development uh, to meet Andy, because Andy came with a remit of developing education, and education was a huge interest of mine. So to have a consultant that was going to be leading that we, was hugely lucky. But just so that you know, we do have women in rheumatology as well. We did eventually get a wise woman that came and joined us. <laughs> And Elaine came to lead and develop the community service, and there was uh, great projects there as, as, as well. So it was a, a really dynamic team that I was finding myself in and, and was lucky to be working. But we still had the dark ages. So pre-1999, no MSc in rheumatology nursing practice existed in the world. In the world? I mean, gosh, how can we believe, believe that? So when I did my uh, master's, it was a very generic programme. So it's really interesting, but there's only so many times you can learn about nursing models. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you sometimes want to learn about your own speciality to develop your own skills. So with having Andy uh, on board, it was a great time for us to do a little bit of work and to see, is there any appetite for a course? Is there anybody else feeling a bit like I was feeling? And we did a postal survey and over 200 nurses, and at that time there was 222 nurses, so I don't know why there was 22, didn't you know, respond, but I'll be happy, I'll be happy with that response rate. But there was a desire for a course and that's what we wanted to see. And in the survey, the nurses were able to identify areas that they wanted to be trained in, wanted to develop their knowledge, wanted to develop their clinical skills in. So this was great because this helps us write the curriculum. You know, we can deliver what people want, which, which is really valuable. So as there was an appetite for the course and then existed, then we wrote the, the first MSc specifically at that time for nurses. We do get a bit more multidisciplinary, but not at that time. We were just, just happy to get something off the ground. And this led to key partnerships, which was brilliant because I'm in clinical practice all the time. I didn't know a lot of people outside rheumatology. I didn't know academics. So it's lovely to actually, you know, meet academics work with our local physicians and this was across the trust so we'd have somebody from dermatology to come and talk about skin manifestations so it was great reaching out it, it helped me develop a real understanding working with people with arthritis and in this picture with Kay is Mike Brooks and Mike's come tonight very grateful Mike to, to see you here as well um, so it was great to have patient input from the start into because we educate the nurses to look after the patients so if we don't know what the patients want how do we know we're getting the education right? So, um, you know, it was, it was a great partnership to do that. And since the course is run, we've only run it every two years, but we've had 63 nurses have completed their dissertation, gone on to do other role development. And although it, was a, it is a modular course, we had Rupa that came from India for two days, which meant the colleagues that came from Swansea complaining about their train journey <laughs> weren't going to get a look in anymore because Rupa came 
She was always full of energy. She looked like she'd just come from next door. And Rupa became the first clinical nurse specialist in India in rheumatology. And we also had people coming from Portugal and Spain as well. So it was great to get, you know, more of a, a mainly European, but bringing other nurses' ideas in and everything was, was great because we all learned from each other. And then in 2000, I became the first nurse consultant in rheumatology. And how that role was at that time, 50% of your time was in clinical activities and 50 in academic work. But because clinical work was so, so busy, it was just one day. But to actually have one day of academic work was brilliant, you know, to do something. Because academic work takes time if you're going to produce something of quality. So to have some designated time was, was, was absolutely uh, wonderful. And so this new role led me to think what education people with RA would want health professionals to have, what knowledge and skills are important to people. Again, I was lucky enough to get some, some funding uh, with Kate Lill, who's here tonight, and with Joe Adams as well. So we did some focus group to find out what was important. And it's not rocket science, but the ability to listen, to understand the patient's experience is absolutely huge. Patients wanted nurses to understand the impact of living with rheumatoid arthritis, provide support and advice, and to signpost to other services. They didn't expect nurses to know everything, but if they had low mood and the nurse didn't feel they had the skills to, to address that, they would know where to refer them on appropriately. And to be accessible as well, which is where the um, telephone advice line comes in as well. So a couple of quotes there. The nurse knows not only about the disease, but she knows what it means to the individual. And that's what I want the nurses of the next generation to have. And this could almost have come from Mike. Come on, isn't it, Mike? Because this is your mantra, isn't it? Might be your, it might be your quote there. But it's coaching about facts and information and empowering people to be able to self-manage. That was what came out as really as important. And again, we could embed that within the curriculum as well. So finding out what was important to patients was so important to help the course remain clinically relevant to people as well. There was other educational developments, and I'm indebted to, to Kath, who's in the audience, and, and to Anne O'Brien as well, for developing the Aspire modules, which were degree-level modules. So we had the MSc, but we wanted to have some degree-level modules and to open it to physios, OTs, pharmacists. We work as a team. Let's, you know, wanted to learn as a team. We've also been um, involved in the development, getting the first nurse specialist in rheumatology in Hong Kong as well. Um, we had a contingent of about eight nurses from Hong Kong that came and joined us for a week at Kiel and did the Aspire course. Um, for European, for, for ULA, which is our European organisation for rheumatology, uh, I've had the privilege of being involved in developing evidence-based practice modules, also done modules for the Royal College of Nursing and the BSR. And we've done lovely work with NRAS, which is our patient organisation. And one of those we did at Port Fell, which was looking at patients as educators. Uh, and Alan, who can't be here tonight, uh, was, was doing that with me and we were being assessed. And that, that was great fun as well, and doing it in an environment that was in the community. One of the first time we took it out of the hospital, um, which, which worked really well. Musculoskeletal care. So when I, when I was uh, chair of the RCN Rheumatology Forum, I used to, the most common request I used to get from colleagues is, we can't get anything published. We're not at that stage. We haven't had the traditional medical training where you do an, an abstract a poster and then move on that way. And we want to be able to publish our own work. So when I was in London at a conference one day, I thought, I'll just go and pop in into, into publishers as you do. And uh, luckily, near the hotel was a publisher called Colin Wurr. And I knew I'd landed you know, on my feet, because I walked in, and he said, would you like a glass of wine? <laughs> I looked behind me, because I'd never met the gentleman, and I thought, gosh, and he had a small office somewhere. I thought, who is this person? Is there somewhere behind me? Because, and he said, oh, come on in, we, we greet all guests with a glass of wine. And from then, Colin, took, Colin Wirr took a punt with developing a journal, which was then taken over by Wiley, um, and, and has been running since 2003. It, it's aimed at first-time writers. You know, it gives people their first step in. And the joy you get and the emails you get from people who have published you know, really make it worthwhile. It, it's wonderful to see, you know, people getting a, a, a paper published for the first time. Just the last few slides there. It's coming up now. 
And then there was another opportunity for me. There was this innovative partnership between the Hayward Foundation. The Hayward Foundation is a fantastic charity that raised funds for local people with arthritis that were set up by Ted Hothersall. Ted did fantastic work raising huge sums of money to develop the bone density service. And Andy has taken over as chair at that time. We've now got Zoe Paskins doing a wonderful job um, leading us all with that at the moment. But this was an opportunity to develop a professor of research nursing. So again, innovative practice. Um, I was lucky enough to do that, uh, to be appointed as the professor of rheumatology nursing, which was a very proud moment. And the journey continues. So Sarah, who's here, so we got some funding, the Ted Hothersall PhD to fund a, a clinical nurse to do a PhD looking at developing patient information resources for people with inflammatory arthritis. Some of the research I've been involved with as well has been exploring the work people are required to do when you have a condition like rheumatoid arthritis and you have to engage in drug monitoring. It's a lot of burden on you, you know, you work, you've got your leisure and you're thinking, oh, I've got to go up for those blood tests yet again. And also looking at optimising the effectiveness of telephone advice line provision. Lots of emails, lots of calls over the last year of rheumatology nurses leaving the profession because they just can't manage with the sheer capacity issues of running the telephone advice line. So that's a huge piece of work for us to do and give the right support and training that, that we need to. I think this might be, oh no, there's two, I think there's, yes, this one and then one more, I think. Never been very good at numbers, that's why I do qualitative. So <laughs> what I remember most about my journey, well, it's the energy, the support and motivation I have the people I've worked with. I have always worked with wonderful people who've always, if I've come up with an idea, they've just said, go with it. <coughs> I've never worked in a negative culture. And I do lots of work with rheumatology teams around the country. And it makes me realise how lucky that is when I'm going and helping other cultures to try to do that. Also, the people with arthritis who have shaped my whole research time uh, and have allowed me to, to ask those questions that have been important to them to feed back into patient care as well. I was awarded, as Pauline Carney said, the Droit Witch Lecture. And this is just uh, to... to uh, remind myself of the lovely team that I work with up in the Hayward Hospital and apologies to anyone that couldn't get into that, uh, that photo shoot at that particular particular time. This is the last slide. So, I've, this, when, you know you've got friends, don't you? So, the, the lady on the far side there, Brenda, Anne was writing her book on uh, polymyalgia rheumatica. He said, I need a picture of somebody that looks like in the, they're in pain walking upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, can you help? You know, the usual kind of thing a mate asks, you know, now, now and again. Brenda actually was a lady who had PMR at that time, although a very close friend of mine. So Brenda did the pictures. And whenever I've been to European conferences, there's always Brenda's picture <laughs> everywhere. That's followed it round because Anna's just presented it so much. The other picture is of my niece and nephew um, who are in the audience. I'm really thankful for Sam and Emma for, for coming down tonight. That's really, uh, really made the evening. I feel I'm getting emotional now, so, <laughs> so I'll stop there. And two lovely great nieces as well. So I've had a lovely time doing what I'm doing, and I just hope I can continue doing it for a, for a bit longer as well. It'll be super. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for listening and for your attention. Today.